You I always did. have to record right away. I'm here with cash. Keith, and he just said an amazing story off camera. <laughs> I, I, man, I when I was promoting the show, like I was on some podcast, and we talked for like twenty five minutes, and we were telling all like it was great, and then they go, "Oh, let me put the recording on that." I was like, "What?" And, and then you sit there and you're worried about whether you're repeating yourself and just like, you know, it's just like, you don't, did I say it on camera already? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It was very embarrassing. <laughs> when, when I did that piece for the comics journal, uh, we, we did an interview like this and then, and then he said, okay, that's all my questions. And then we talked for like 45 minutes after. And I, I said to him, you know, we said some pretty good stuff that you didn't record. And uh, so what we wound up doing was he, he sent me the notation and then he, he put little notes. You talked about this after, do you want to insert a little something? And, uh, and, and so then I, I would, uh, you know, try and rephrase the things that we said after the fact. And, and then I would say, you know, oh, maybe ask me this leading question and then I can talk about this. And we totally curated this interview so the, the behind the scenes secrets of uh promoting yourself <laughs> well I, I mean listen th those things are the when the camera is off or when you're not recording that's when the best stuff happens that's why it's just like so good to just turn it on and not like even you know i I think Matt, Mark Marin uh, of the WTF podcast, he's really good at that. Mm -hmm. You know, he just has this casual conversation for a long time and he's already been recording. So right. um, he gets people into a real casual state, which I like. You know. Yeah. So this is kind of a funny question, but as, as I was getting ready to film with you, I was thinking, I don't know if I've seen you without a hat. <laughs> Well, that it, it's been my thing, you know. I had lots of hair at one time, and um, and then I, I had dreads, oh. and, uh, and then I cut them off, and then someone was like, "Hey, you're losing your hair." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, okay." And how so, long ago was that? That was probably nine two thousand and two. Because I I probably met you around two thousand four. So. Yeah. So I, you know, I have a, I have a little bit of hair, but, um, yeah. but I, I've always been a hat guy, even when I had hair. So it's, it's, it's a good fashion thing, you know. And I, I, I thought this would be fun to share with you some of my hats. I grew up in South Lake Tahoe, so yeah, you've always had good hats. One of my favorites here, uh -huh. and then uh, this, this is one I've had since college. And again, a, a good snow hat. I, I remember drawing a self-portrait in college uh, wearing this hat. And I, I would, you know, wear it out when it's cold. But also if I'm sick, I, I, I get that comfort. And then this is the one I'm proudest of. This one I've had since probably fifth or sixth grade. It was my dad's hat up skiing. In Ooh, Tahoe. nice. Nice. Like that baby, huh? And that, that one we got in Tahoe. Oh, yeah. Let's... Let's share our fashions, huh? <laughs> this isn't mine. I think this is the one that my my son wears. Nice. We were at, we were at the uh, UNC men's soccer elite eight playoff last night, and he was sporting <laughs> this. Um, I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice because it was this light rain, and I said, you know, this is where. You know, when it's light rain like this in the evening, this is where magic happens. But UNC still lost, so. <laughs> Shucks. Yeah. yeah. The hat didn't do it? I don't believe that. <laughs> the hat didn't do it. But we did find great parking, so maybe the hat did oh, do so it. so maybe the hat found you the parking. Yeah. I, I'm sure the hat was involved in something good happening. <laughs> so Excellent. I, I've listened to uh, some of your fun interviews, and I, I was saying off camera that I, I just find you so literate and smart and entertaining and funny. And um, at, at Comic Con this year, I, I went and sat in on that panel that you and Lonnie gave, and and I, 
I was just loving, you know, hearing you speak. And so when, when I found more footage of you talking online, I, I thought, this is great. And um, I, I was intrigued. You, you talked in some of these interviews about getting into comics and how it was the comic strips. And you mentioned Dune, Dunesbury earlier. And uh, in other interviews, I heard you talk about Peanuts. And I, I think how this is interesting, uh, I can see how that would shape a young mind toward a, a lot of the kinds of things you do. Um, I, my first comics, I, I read some of the, you know, let's see, like Garfield and Farside. And um, what, what really stuck with me were like Stanley Ditko comics and uh, the, the idea of that sort of secret uh, clubhouse you belong to uh, when you read Marvel comics or DC comics, or who are all these characters with all these crazy costumes and uh, secret identities and whose powers are what. And uh, a, a lot of that stuck with me for my journey. So I, I wanna hear about your, your kind of formative years and how that got into, uh, you said you had an education, uh, the college, uh, you, you've talked a lot about your, your teachers uh and how they you know kind of formed this this cartoonist you became if, if th that that's a big wide open question but but i thought you could just talk about it a little because i i just thought it was really interesting your uh journey yeah well i mean it's i i think i came up as a newspaper cartoonist guy i was not i, I wasn't into superhero comics mm -hmm. because they never ended they always left you with a cliffhanger and that dro drove me crazy. <laughs> like that's why, that's why a lot of K Chronicles, well, like, first of all, that's the reason why I just do one pager. So it's just like, it's going to end. It may be wordy, but it's going to end. And it's the reason why I put a stop sign at the end of my comics. And, and why stop. you even uh, have a single panel comic. You, you took it to the extreme, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but that literal stop sign, I took that from SATs because SATs would just would never end. And then you would look forward to find that. And it was such a pleasing thing to see that stop sign. So I was like, I'm going to put that stop sign in my comic. I love and it. I didn't realize how effective it was until I sort of got a little lazy and stopped putting it in there. And then someone said, hey, what happened to your stop signs? Like, like it just feels so good to see that stop sign. And I was like, oh man, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do that. You just don't realize it, right? Um, but yeah, like newspaper cartoons ended, and that was the thing. Like, I just wanted something to end. And so for me, it was important to just have a comic that maybe in the big scheme of things, a bunch of the comics together may tell some sort of arc story, but but at least you can just read that. And if you never read another one again, at least you have that story there. So yeah, this, this I, I is, always lean towards uh, newspaper comics. This is and, the opposite of what I was saying, where uh, you, you have it all right there. And if, if you miss a few days worth or whatever, it doesn't matter, you're, you're still good. So, yeah, and, um, and I was, I love the newspaper because it had a comics page. You know, back in the day, it had, you know, it had a, 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 a very healthy comics page. But then I noticed that there were comics on the editorial page. Um, this was in Boston. There was there was a sports comic in the sports section. If you went into the classified, there were single panels back there. So it made me read the whole newspaper. Like I would be searching all through the newspaper for cartoons. And then... I realized if I go up the street to my great uncle's house, you know, we had the Boston Globe, he had the Boston Herald. And so there were all these other comics in there, you know, and it, and, and it just, I love that. And, um, and when I went to the library, like the only comics that uh, the library had, maybe it was underfunded, I don't know, but it just had Junesbury and it had, uh, it had Peanuts. So I read all of those. I remember, the local newspaper, uh, not newspaper, the local uh, department store, Stewart's, had like Doonesbury from when he was drawing them 
they they were still in college. Like maybe he wasn't. He probably wasn't in college anymore. But it was the first time I saw black characters that weren't just like everybody else and just with lines on their faces. They actually talked about black things, you know. So like this one character showed up to Doomsbury's uh, dormitory and it's like, hey, you know, do you want to? Do you want to uh, donate to the to the on campus black Black Panther um, party? And they're like, oh no, man, and, you know we don't have anybody. Oh no, no, you know I'm out of my. And he's like, okay. And then the black character takes this marker and writes an X on their door <laughs> and walks up. And you know, like it was hilarious. <laughs> and I, I as that really resonated with me. And then the other thing was um. Parliament Funkadelic albums. Parliament Funkadelic albums were full of these wild cartoons. Uh, uh, they were done by Pedro Bell and Overton Lloyd. And they were this, just these like, almost like vomiting on the page, like all this funky drawing and all these lyrics and all this really cool stuff. And so we, me and my cousin would copy those and we would love doing those. And then uh, Mad Magazine, of course. Mad Magazine was huge uh for me coming up and then archie digest archie digest the reason why my collections are the size that they are is because of archie digest i i just i don't know i was just really and the only time i would buy them was my my ski club would have a clam bake every year in duxbury beach in massachusetts and in that that beach store that was on the beach, they would have all these Archie uh, digests and I would just buy all of them and just sit there and read Archie. But like, those are all my, <laughs> oh, and Dynamite. There was this magazine called Dynamite that was like Scholastic put out or I don't know who put it out, but John Holmstrom used to contribute to it. John Holmstrom was, he created Punk Magazine with somebody else. And he drew these crazy cartoons, like crazy, nutty, insane cartoons that I don't understand how he they had him in this mainstream magazine. But but it just once I followed him and realized where he came from, I was like, oh, OK. But it really turned me on to like all this punk stuff and um. So it was it's just a combination of, you know, the John Holmstrom stuff, the Overton Lloyd, Pedro Bell stuff, Mad Magazine, Doonesbury. Um, and then, you know, as as I got older, obviously Calvin and Hobbes was huge, um, uh, the far side, but also uh, Warner Brothers cartoons too. Warner Brothers cartoons and hip hop. Like, I feel like our, like the generation that we're from, we, came up in like where the satire, like we, you just took from everything. And and I'm telling you, like, you know, Warner Brothers are funny when you're small. And then when you, they're even funnier when you get all the context that they're talking about. But I mean, it's the same thing with hip hop. Like, you know, a lot of the hip hop that I would listen to if you looked into the lyrics and stuff and what the stuff they 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 were saying like follow go down those things it's just like oh wow and and you know i hopefully we brought that to my band the marginal prophets and i i will say just the other day my wife we homeschool our kids my wife was teaching american literature she teaches american literature this year uh, this semester and she used marginal prophets lyrics to uh you know to teach alliteration pseudonym uh what is it anonymatea but no no i can't even, i've never yeah. pronounced it. yeah 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 just like all of the different things you know and it's totally true like metaphor all that stuff and and it's we were lucky enough to come up through that generation so like I don't know. It's just, I, I think we were very lucky. Like just before 
you know, we've had the internet, you know, we had, we were, we came up without the internet. Now we have the internet. I, I, I like, I think we're in that sweet spot that not everybody can say they are, you know, Gen X, man. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you went into college, were you already making comics? I, I was, I was making comics in high school and, and, I've talked about this. They were auto. They were auto bio comics. They were they were characters based on my friends. And and I, I, now I see it as I was basically creating me. Like none of the books I ever got, none of the schoolwork, anything had reflected any anybody that looked like me as heroes. You know. So it was super important to create these comics that like had me as the hero. <laughs> And, and and my friends as the heroes. So I think that was a huge thing. Um, and, you know, I've talked about this in the past. I had a great English teacher that let me do um, a comic book report on Animal Farm. And, and so I did it instead of animals taking over the farm, it was me and my friends taking over the school and kicking out the teachers under 18 good, over 18 bad. And he loved it. And, and just he told me about the syndicated comic strip for the very first time. And that's how I started looking into it. But, um, and then, yeah, I did it for my high school newspaper, college newspaper. Things super changed when I had this great teacher, uh, American literature teacher that gave us all, was my first black teacher, gave us all black writers. And this was in college? Yeah, when I was a junior in college. Yeah, so 13 or something years of school. Yeah, and, and someone said, why are you giving us all black? teach uh black writers and he said i'm giving you all american writers and that was like that that i think really it, it was right around that time also like public enemy was huge and and tribe called press and all that stuff like it was like perfect time for me to sort of i don't know shape the message and and the thing that i wanted to do with my work and um and to this day, like that, like that was that, that time was that seminal moment, you know, yeah. where my, my work really said, okay, you know, I'm going to write about being black in this sort of late eighties Reagan, just say no, you know, every, everybody who's into rap is a gang member type of thing. And I'm just going to upend that and just you know show that oh people into rap like any rap artist has to be a connoisseur of all music you know and to be an effective rapper you have to be like so well versed in so many things you know and i think uh yeah i think it, that's proven itself over time that teacher who taught all black authors could have responded, well, your class last quarter was all white authors. I love that instead of even bringing the issue up, just said, these are American authors. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, and, and I mean, clearly those who know better will come to that conclusion themselves without him, you know, and that's what I, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, like, yeah, like, and it's amazing how he just, I, I tried looking him up, like, I think in 2015, and he died the year before. Oh. So, yeah, I wanted to thank him. And, and yeah. But in his obituary, he said, like, he was put on this earth to, to teach and uplift his people in life. You know, I am, I am a, a, uh, the walking manifestation of that that philosophy. So it's yeah. great. We, uh, I, I think you've got a couple years on me. I'm 51. And uh, when I turned 50, I, I started really sensing my mortality and uh, realizing the clock is ticking for how many projects I have left in me realistically, you know, just just physically how many I can get through and stuff. And it, 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 it's affected me also in ways of uh talking with people like you 
and 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 realizing you know little things like hearing a student was changed by something you said or created that that's made big differences in my life you know and 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 i realize as i'm getting older why not pay that forward you know now now is the time to let people know that what what they did spoke to me and changed me you know in in these ways yeah. that i consider positive and I, I i've been making real concerted efforts to to just reach out hey i read your comic and i really loved it and what i loved about it was this this and this or it, it made me think about these things and uh you know let people know because we're, we're in a vacuum and uh we we don't always hear it you know and and those totally. times that you do hear it are just oh they the I, I, I say this a lot, which is it doesn't take much to just give somebody a compliment or just appreciate something that somebody does. And and I go out of my way at least once a day to just say something nice to just some person that I don't even know, you know? Yeah, just on the street. Hey, I like your hat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it, it's crazy how some people are completely shocked and taken aback by it. Like, you know, just not, it, it's just such a rare, and I, I wish people, you know, would yeah. practice that because it, it, it does it not only makes them feel good, it makes you feel good. Yeah, and, connection, um, right? But also, well, yeah. I like that band on your shirt. Yeah, yeah. And just uh, connected. That's it. But like, the internet is like it's like the best thing and the worst thing that's ever happened to us especially cartoonists and you just wouldn't treat someone in person the way some people treat people on the internet you just wouldn't say these things but it's so much better to be able to say and share things to people in person and that's i, I think that's another really important thing that comes back to the conventions and stuff um we need that and and we need to say we need to compliment our peers and talk to you know that's how you you make connections that's how you find publishers that's that's how you uh that's how a lot of my gigs come about is is um people just inquiring and they say, listen, I do, I do stuff in person. I do stuff over Zoom now. I mean, it's nice that the Zoom thing is happening now because the people that can't afford to fly me out, the, the organizations, I can still do it all over Zoom, which is nice, but, but I really like to do it in person. It's much better. Yeah, for sure. Um, when you were in college, did you realize you were going to be pursuing a job in comics or were you thinking music or did you not know or oh I, listen the music thing came completely by accident but i knew i was going to do comics okay you know there were only two in salem state back in the day and they still don't have any comics uh comics classes but they graduated two award-winning syndicated co cartoonists myself and mark barisi so people think that like they've got something there so, something wrong but they don't <laughs> And, and um, I I just remember going, like, I was like, I even got in there. It's so my mom applied and she's like, you know, I wasn't even thinking about it. And uh, well, I, I kind of was, but, uh, you know, she said, what about Salem? It's close by, you know, I didn't want to be that far away. It's like 30 minutes from where I live. And she got me in. Um, I think we were actually too close to to be able to live on campus, but she worked for the state. And so I think she had a little in, so I got into the dormitory. And once I was there, I was like, oh my goodness, like what, why didn't I even, you know, why was I reluctant to do this? It was great. But, um, but they only had two tracks, graphic design or fine arts. I was like, okay, you know, my parents are horrified that I want to be a cartoonist, even though they encourage me all the time. I was like, why did you encourage me then? And they said, well, we didn't know you'd taken it this seriously. And they were like, there's no money in it. And they were right. But um, 
but I took graphic design. I'm like, okay, I'll take graphic design. You know, maybe they'll be happy. So when I would be taking all these classes, I would always, my, my, I had the perfect advisor, by the way. Remember I told you that the ceramics guy that was like, oh, you don't have to show up. I had the exact opposite of him for an advisor, which I had a complete hard ass. He was like, like, you better show up to this class, blah, 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 blah. And it, it, it's true. I showed up to all those classes <laughs> and, and, but I would tell him, I'd say, listen, I, you know, I, yeah, all right, I'm going to get a degree in graphic design, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be a cartoonist. Like, I don't, you know, I don't need any of this stuff. And he would be, he'd be all mad. He's like, I'm not going to let you graduate, blah, 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 blah. And um, the funny thing was, is when I came back to, you know, do talks and everything, and he had already retired. I had one of the other um, professors say, she, she goes, you know, he would yell at you all the time. He goes, she, she said, oh, but when you would leave, he would sit and tell us, He's going to be the most successful uh, graduate out of this program. <laughs> so, yeah, that's it's great. really, yeah, it's really nice. But, but like he knew what I needed. And, and, and this is the same with the, um, the American literature teacher. He gave me an A minus. He never gave me an A. And I was like, what? Like, even though I, I thought I was like doing really great, but he was always, he was always like, you can do better. You can do better, you know? And, um, and I, I totally appreciate that, that stuff these days, you know, um, it's, it's super hard, but the, the, the music thing came about because, um, I was a DJ on the school radio station. We had one of the first hip hop shows on our, our school radio station. And we had these, it was me and my cousin, we'd be spinning hip hop. And then the jazz guys would come in after us and they were seniors See, and they were stoners and they'd come in and they'd be like, eh. and uh one of them but we'd have great banter it was really funny they were really cool and uh one of them was a filmmaker and he's like hey he goes i want you guys to play i want you guys to be in my new film and you know you guys i want you guys to be rappers in this new film and I'm like oh okay yeah sure he goes but you got to come up with a song and we're like yeah all right yeah sure why not so we came up with this song. We, you know, we shot the thing. And what happened was three years later, someone took a recording of that song and put it into a contest for uh, a battle of the bands. And we didn't have a band, but we got into the finals. <laughs> and so in three weeks or two weeks, I can't remember. But we had to, we wrote five songs, and we put the band together. We were like, okay, you know, uh, who can we? find to play drums it's like oh there was this black kid that was into heavy metal that we knew back in high school uh, this guy paul and he's and we're like let's call paul up so we called paul up so we had this basically had this heavy black heavy metal drummer he like played like was into sabbath and everything and then we're like okay craig was uh was our this DJ, our friend who loved uh he would scratch on turntables they're like oh okay we'll have him uh, my artist buddy Pierre played bass. Um, the stoner jazz guy played guitar, and then we had another guy who played guitar too. So like one would play, you know, lead guitar, one would play. Um, and we we got it together and and created like I mean it was like a mashup, obviously, of hip hop, punk rock, like, and we knew it was. It, it was effective because somebody got really mad and was being broadcast on, on the radio station uh, live and they took it off and put on Culture Club or something. <laughs> and they said, you guys sound too much like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And this was like, I mean, this was like back in the day when, you know, before the Red Hot Chili Peppers started singing, which I, I have a, an issue with. But so it was like, really, I was like, really? Oh, that sounds cool. Like Fishbone, Red Hot Chili Pepper. And um, and so we just started playing out. We started playing different shows and and uh, and things were going really well. But I had already said that I was going to move to San Francisco. But some, a DJ who went on to be a big DJ in Boston said, I think you have something here. I think you should 
you know, this was before like Rage Against the Machine, everything, all this stuff came out. So she's like, I think you should stay in Boston and just work at this for a year. And so I took everyone aside I, 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 at practice. I said, listen, I will stay in Boston for one year if you guys give a thousand percent to this. Like, like you have to give a thousand percent. And everybody said yes, except my cousin and my buddy Craig, who the two guys that I grew up with, like hung out with, they, you know, they, they were like, no, nah, no. Nah. And of course, like a year and a half, two years later, like when I would come back to go, oh man, like Rage Against the Machine, all this different stuff. Like maybe we should have done that. Maybe I was like, screw you guys, you know, <laughs> so bad. But, but then, you know, when I got to San Francisco, I started the Marginal Profits and, 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 you know, we did all the stuff that we did. So um, it, it, it came about, but it, it was just one of those things where it's like, oh, wow. I guess I can do music. <laughs> you know? And uh, the same thing was uh, when I wrote this, uh, when I wrote my first scene in the TV show uh, for, you know, in Woke, uh, it was the scene in the pilot where my character and the Clovis character find a doll, uh, find a wallet while they're walking home from something. And, you know, my character wants to bring it to the police and the other character's like, what? No way. Like this is some, you know, white woman's wallet and all the credit cards and money are stolen out and you want us to walk in with, you know, because uh, when I was done with it, I knew like I could write for television because it, 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 it does all the stuff that you want a scene to do, which is it, it defines the characters without blatantly defining the characters you're defining the characters through their actions and so there's a thing and then there's a great out where uh clovis just grabs the wallet and then just checks it <laughs> and and so it has that surprising ending um, once I, that thing was done i was like okay i can write television you know um so yeah it was making really the realization i can do this i got yeah it. yeah 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 and I think I think a lot of times we just we don't think we can do it until we actually do it. And so that thing, you know, going back to that person is like, oh, you know, I want I have an idea for a comic. Like, um, just do it. Just do it. Put your just go forward and do it. OK. All right. Well, everyone should order my graphic novel about my time as a Michael Jackson impersonator in high school. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Always fun. Watch Woke on Hulu. Um, I don't know if they offer the free week, but you can watch the whole series within a week without paying for it. Um, so I would just say do that. And uh, yeah, and just support support your local gentleman cartoonist. Everybody, Keith is, is a fantastic voice in, in comics. You, you will uh, be glad you checked them out if, if you haven't already for some reason. <laughs> Thanks again, Keith. I look forward to seeing you next time. All right, man. Thanks.